Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Life in the Red podcast. Your co-hosts, as usual, Luke Mullen and Amy Just, coming at you from February, shortest month of the year. Some would say the most forgettable. Any thoughts on uh, on February? It's underrated. Underrated? How come? I don't know. I just, I mean, this weekend is supposed to be nice outside. That's true. I feel like a blip. Um, it's this month where the Super Bowl is... Um, you know, how do, can you not love that? I love Super Bowl food. It's a, it's a compelling argument. I'll say, hey, it gets over and quicker. <laughs> Mardi Gras is not always in February, but it is this year. So, a personal, a personal favorite over here. It is my favorite <laughs> holiday. Yeah. Eh, second favorite holiday. I think Halloween is my favorite, and then Mardi Gras is number two. But in terms of college <laughs> sports, February is not always the most happening month. But, you know, basketball. Gets Base- winding down to an important, important point. Of course, and baseball, baseball starts. Yeah, Mr. Baseball I softball. love baseball doesn't like well, February. No, well, Get out of here. <laughs> February baseball is not always good baseball. So it's still baseball. It is. It is. And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but, you know, February, a little bit of kind of transition period. And so why not transition podcast somewhat? Uh, talking about football, you know, finishing up recruiting class. We'll get into basketball. And of course, your favorite, the random segment to end things off as usual. But I think, you know, talk of the town in football. Hey, we just had National Signing Day, which, you know, five, six years ago is like, okay. Appointment the viewing. Event. Yeah. Crazy decisions. People call off work. Yep. To, to watch. And now I feel like it's more of a forgotten thing, which that's the advent of the early signing period is more people sign then. And... You know, National Signing Day just is a not as big of a party anymore. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a formality at this point. You know, if you haven't signed yet, oh yeah, National Signing Day, yeah, that'll do. But you know, still important, obviously, for all the teams. And from a Nebraska perspective, uh, finally got the chance to wrap up its 2023 class, signed five more prospects, a uh, total of 39 additions, 28 high school and 11 transfers. Uh, that's a lot. <laughs> I was so close. I was so close you said to 40? Being, I said 40. Yep. Well, they could still get there. They could still get there. Technically true. Yeah. <laughs> but the most recent high school commits want to give them a, a quick moment to, you know, shout them out and see who Nebraska's getting. Defensive lineman Sua Lafodu and cornerback DeAndre Barnes were the last two uh, they committed between our last podcast. And Lafodu, he's a guy played for a, a big time high school powerhouse, St. John Bosco. Uh, you know, that, that kind of impacts your playing time. But Hey, in practice, he's going up against great players. Uh, had been committed to Washington for a while. A lot of interest there on the West Coast, but coming here to Nebraska instead. And DeAndre Barnes, Matt Rule told a, a brief, you know, but very interesting anecdote uh, at that National Signing Day presser about Marcus Soderfield just driving through Denver. Sees, sees Regis Jesuit. You know, that's a it's a pretty big, pretty big school, pretty good program up there. He says, ah, you know, maybe maybe I should stop by. And that, that leads them to uh, eventually get Barnes to campus, get him recruited. Sprinter, really fast, uh, played wide receiver too. So one of those guys that may be under the radar a little bit, but Nebraska found a way to get him here. Yeah, and, and it's not like they had no idea about that high school, right? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> they've recru- this class, I think, has another one in there. Um, or at least they've recruited out of there. Multiple so. guys, yeah. So it's yep. not like some random, like – school that just appeared out of nowhere, but still pretty cool when it's not on your agenda and you find a eh, diamond in the rough isn't right. Uh, a, an uncovered gem. They're uncovering a, a gem that had been previously uh, undiscovered. Undiscovered gem. There we go. Yep. That was what I was looking for. Too wordy today. You're saying that Matt Rule did a better job of, of telling the story than I did. Matt did a better job of telling the story than I did. <laughs> <laughs> He's good. He's he, he, he's good at you know telling those stories, those anecdotes. He's a he's a fast talker too. He is. He's not yeah. enjoyable to disc- <laughs> to transcribe, but I'd rather transcribe him than Ed Ogeron. So I'll take it. <laughs> Fair enough. And you know, on the topic of Barnes, I think it's kind of a a wider, I don't know, lens of the recruiting strategy. A guy like that, speed, versatility, can play multiple positions, has that track and field background. You know, they, these are traits we've been identifying in a lot of players, um, and they're very common among this class, and I'll be very interested to see, you know, R- Rule was saying those track times, you know, 
inform him about a player, you know, let him know stuff about, you know, their athleticism, you know, their ability to, to translate that to football. But I'll be very interested to see if the same kind of mold of player they continue going after, or, you know, maybe they'll adjust things a little bit once they've had the chance to flip this roster a little bit. We'll see. I think he likes the, the multi-sport speedsters because you can get somebody faster, but like speed like that, that's yeah. genetic. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, you know, he, he, he said it himself. He's had a lot of success, you know, moving players around. You just got to get them in the building. You know, sometimes you, you start practicing in one position and you're like, hey, you know, maybe, maybe this position would be better. So spring, I'll be very interested to see as well. Are there any guys, you know, in the spring that they're already, you know, confident about, hey, moving spots? I don't know. Might, might take a little bit longer to see that come to fruition, but there are a lot of a lot of players, at least in this twenty three recruiting class, that already have those those two A potentials. It's all a puzzle, and they just have to figure it out. Recruiting is one big puzzle, huh? But as as we uh, wrap up this twenty three class, as I said, you know, we we talked about the rankings a while ago, and they continued to to go up a little bit as these commitments trickled in. Like I said, things pretty much finalized at this point. Husker is 28th ranked in the nation on On3, 25th via ESPN, and 24th on both Rivals and 24-7 Sports. Top 25 class, I mean, they were 50th or whatever when, you know, the coaching change comes in. And, you know, we knew that this stuff would happen. We talked about it in December, too. They'd risen a lot. But still, now that, you know, things have fully settled down, it's like, hey, they really, I mean, they, they grinded for a few weeks to, to get to this point. Yeah, and I mean, look, like I said it, you know, back in December, like naturally, like these things are going to progress as they get, you know, their class and their people mm -hmm. and put the finishing touches on an incomplete class, right? Um, but yeah, this is a, a pleasant surprise. I didn't know how high they'd get. 24-25 um, uh, is pretty good, um, but we have to see what they can do, right? You know? Winning recruiting rankings doesn't mean anything if it doesn't pan out. You know, you mean perennial off-season national champions? Nebraska doesn't doesn't translate. You know, no, it doesn't. But it's a good start, right? Yeah. You need good players to win, but you can also have good players and lose. So, anyway, moving on. Our next, well, yeah, we're sticking with uh, a little bit of recruiting here. Most impactful in two different ways um start off with high school commits i think we're on the same page here <laughs> yeah we're agreed you know there, there's a couple <laughs> a couple that stand out and number one is coming from right here in lincoln malachi coleman um you know really just exploded as as a recruit there in the last you know 18 or so months had that national spotlight and you know committed to nebraska then you have the coaching change and it's, you know, suddenly you start to wonder, you're like, hey, this might be the best player coming out of Lincoln and Nebraska in a long time from an athletic profile. And is Nebraska really going to go and lose him to Colorado was ultimately one of the top runners. But, you know, there, there were other major programs, Michigan, Georgia offered him, you know, there, there are these big time schools. And ultimately, you know, Matt Rule is able to, to keep Malachi at home, keep him in Lincoln at Nebraska. And, you know, you think about the way he's going to project at wide receiver. Again, like we were saying with that versatility, I mean, there were schools recruiting him as edge rusher, but as a pure wide receiver, I mean, his speed, his catch radius, th this stuff is just incredible to think about the way if he continues to develop, I mean, he's going to be such a, a big, impactful player for this program. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, he, when I was doing my podcast yesterday uh, with Sam McEwen up in Omaha, he was the guy that I said was mm -hmm. the freshman that I'm most excited about um, just because looking at the depth of the wide receiver room, like maybe he'll get a shot to play this upcoming season. You know, they return a lot of, you know, key pieces, uh, but they lose Trey Palmer. So that's a huge gap to fill. Um, and I'm interested to see how, uh, how the mix and the depth chart breaks down uh, with the guys that they currently have. And then, I mean, they brought in a lot of receivers, too. It's not just Malachi. So that's going to be fascinating to, to find that out. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I think will maybe help him separate a little bit, you know, from those other receivers early on is 
his catch radius, you know, he's, he's tall, 6'5", and he's got long arms. You know, obviously, I, I kind of throw it back to some of these, you know, high school moments for these in-state players that I've watched for a couple of years. And the first time I saw Malachi, uh, he was a junior at Lincoln East football practice before the season. You know, they, they've got no Walters, all-state quarterback. You know, he, he can sling it. He can put it in tight pockets. And I, I was watching, you know, they were doing these, like, you know, corner of the end zone drills. And five catches in a row, Malachi just keeps hauling in, you know, these corner of the end zone, you know, like perfectly thrown balls. And I said, hey, you know, this, he could be a playmaker for the Spartans. Obviously, you know, we're, we're a couple of years removed from that, but it's that same kind of, you know, big play or, you know, when, when they need it most, he has that ability to, to come up with the, the catches and, and, you know, his, uh, his speed out there as a, a track star, if you can get him going on a vertical, I mean, we, we've seen how, how impactful that can be, truly. It's only February, but I'm getting excited for football season already. Like I said, off season, the off season hype never, uh, never dies down. No, over here. it does not. Yeah, the other, the other player that we're both agreeing in, a uh, big, big position of need, and hopefully, you know, the Huskers are hoping that they filled it for the next couple of years. It's Omaha West Side kicker uh, Tristan Alvano. Yeah, I I like his upside. I like his potential. Um, is he going to play this next season? Probably not, but you never know. They have a really good kicker um, already, mm. um, who played through a lot of injuries last year. Yeah. Uh, you can see him limping all over and still executing. Um, it's good to see, but yeah, I want to want to see what Tristan can learn uh, from Ed Foley and everybody in the room, and uh, maybe uh, the next guy down the road here in a couple of years. Absolutely, and you know, somewhat similar to to Malachi, it was also a big one too because these kind of you know can't miss kickers don't come about often let alone in Nebraska, I mean, in, in any state across the country. I mean, kicking is just, it's very hard to project, you know, very uh, variable, I suppose you could say. You know, it's, it, a lot of the times it's a high school, you know, high school kicker coming out isn't going to be a four-year starter. But with Tristan, he has that potential to, to do that or at least, you know, to be a, a four-year contributor, whatever it may be. And, you know, just from speaking with him and, and Malachi too, both these guys have great attitudes. They're both coming here to learn. You know, they, they know it's going to be a grind to get out there on the field, but when you have that talent and that attitude, it's, it's easy to see it, it paying off for both of them. Absolutely. But of course, it's, it's not just these high schoolers that are coming in. Mm -hmm. These transfers are coming in. They're ready to play. You know, they're coming from big, major college football programs. Uh, so want to give our thoughts on those transfers, too. I'll just start off Chief Borders and Elijah Judy. I'm going to group them both in as edge rusher, just such a big position of need. And I think both those guys, Judy can maybe line up, you know, more as a, a defensive end. It's still funny, these off conversations. It's like, you know, where are these guys really going to line up in the scheme? We'll figure that out eventually. But both those guys, I think, you know, have, have big time talent. They've shown the ability to, to, to produce in limited doses. And they're going to have that chance to go out there and earn a starting spot right away. Yeah. And this is where uh, we disagreed. Um, though, not that I disagree with you on that. I think those two will be impactful i just want to know what they're doing on defense first before i s good figure yeah. out okay who's gonna you know be the guys there um so i stuck with the offense and i went with uh ben scott and jeff sims uh nebraska needs a center trent hickson is done and i think that uh ben scott will be a seamless transition in that position if they do want to play him at center like he has uh previously he can also play tackle too um which is you never know you need talented tackles as yep. well so regardless of where he lines up um i think he will be very impactful uh for them and then jeff sims uh he is going to have an amazing opportunity this spring because Casey Thompson and Logan Smothers will be out all of spring with shoulder injuries. They're going to rehab those, you know, hopefully get back tip-top shape and be able to compete in the fall. But Jeff has a really amazing opportunity here to kind of get as many reps as possible and, you know, become, you know, integrated with the team and this staff in a way that you can't replicate other than through reps and through 
leading the huddle. Uh, remember what that yep. is? And um, and all of those things. And I think that that is going to pay dividends for him come fall. Will he be the starter? I don't know. Uh, but he's going to have a lot of time in the spring to make the case that he deserves to be. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of impact, he'd, he'd be the biggest. He has the biggest potential yeah. impact. No yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. Well. It was a layup, and I took it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I've, I could also just throw in for the edge right. I mean, MJ Sherman is also yep. going to be an impact. And realistically, I mean, all the transfers, you don't bring these guys in unless you have an idea of them contributing pretty much immediately. And yep. that's why they came here as well. Absolutely. But, you know, as is always the case with recruiting, there's always a few that get away. And in, in this one, uh, Worth going over all these guys, but to me, Zane Flores just has to has to stand out as a, a can't miss, you know, power five quarterback prospect from within the state. And it, it's it's a really kind of a tricky one to pinpoint. Obviously, you can throw a lot of the blame on the previous staff. You can throw the blame on Scott Frost. Say you didn't recruit him hard enough, but yeah. At, but I mean, at at the end of the day. Let's say they evaluate him as number one, you know, quarterback, got to go after him, you know, recruit him. They do a great job building relationships. I mean, Zane, you know, like any player, he has his own motivations. He could have chosen, you know, Oklahoma State or, or any other school on his own. So, you know, ultimately the, the misgivings you could say with, you know, misidentifying his talent or maybe not recruiting him hard enough, that's part of the equation for sure. But I think, you know, just having that guy, that caliber of talent, People who watched him, especially as a senior, I mean, he was making college throws into such tight windows. Uh, it's, it's just, it's just going to haunt Nebraska for a long time if he does go on and achieve the level that I think he can play out there in college. At least uh, Nebraska fans aren't going to have to watch him in the Big Ten. I think that would be even more painful. Yes, no doubt. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, you always wonder, um, and maybe he. Maybe he just didn't want to come to Nebraska regardless of who the coach was. Yep. Maybe he just didn't feel like it was a great fit, like academically wise. Like people go out of state for college for so many reasons, myself included. So not that I'm, you know, like a great fullback or anything, but, <laughs> you know, there are, like you said, there's always a ton of reasons why anybody decides to do anything in life. So, yep, and I, I wish I think, him the best. Yeah, I think he's going to be a great fit for that Oklahoma State offense too. too. Strong arm, pocket, pocket presence. Um, I think I think that's a that goes a long way in that Gundy led offense. So we will see how he progresses. In another one from in state, Ben Bramer, uh, Pierce tight end, committed for a very long time. Uh, strong relationships with the previous staff, and ultimately, you know, had had good relationships with Iowa State too. You know, new staff comes in and and makes that decision to go to Iowa State where you have those pre-existing relationships. Again, I think he's I think he's going to do a great job in college. He's got great attributes as, you know, in terms of size. Again, you know, very hungry, motivated player. Um, you know, probably will need to put on a little bit of weight to to play tight end position. I uh, was more kind of a wide receiver in high school, but losing him, Andrew Metzger as we we kind of alluded to with with the Regis Jesuit talk and Eventually, you know, they go and they fill that need with Ismael Smith-Flores, but a different kind of player, very raw, um, just started playing high school football as well. So you kind of, you lose those two tight ends that you think might be able to, you know, come in, contribute very quickly, and especially Bramer, he he stands out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, you just look at the depth of the position, and they have really talented tight ends, um, but how many young ones do they have? So... Interesting. Well, mm -hmm. ones that are healthy. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, just to wrap up this recruiting talk, of course, you know, we can't forget the Walter Rouse saga, you know. I know. The one, what was it, two days? Two days? One day? Uh, it was... 36 hours? Who knows? It was very short. Um, felt like a, a one episode of a TV show. It's like a fever dream at this point. Did it, did did it, it really, really happen? happen? <laughs> yes. Yes, it did. But uh, you know, they, I was I was excited yeah. about that one. Yes, yeah, he he was going to be a big time addition. You know, they they end up and they do fill the need eventually getting Jacob Hood. You know, a, a very talented tackle in his own right. So, you know that that one might not be one where you look back on and say, oh, you know, they were you what know destroyed. Yeah, but 
but ultimately he's, he's a very talented player, not, not heading to Nebraska as we once thought. Finally, put that put that bow on uh, 2023 recruiting. We'll have some, uh, you know, some intermittent updates as the staff gets some developments in 2024. But on to this, the sport that's in season, basketball. I mean, whew, we, we were talking about the men's team struggles last, uh, last episode. and They have continued. They have continued. Now lost four in a row, six of the last seven. Uh, two very, very frustrating losses. Um, turnovers kind of the the tail of the tape some of them like unforced like really stupid Mm -hmm. ones too that are just like boneheaded mistakes laziness not all of them right but one-handed passes yeah you can't do that um but they did and here we are so um and we talked to uh fred hoiberg and Derek walker today um, and that was a big point of emphasis for them was you're going to turn the ball over. They have a lot of young guys who don't have a ton of experience playing right now. So you expect that sometimes from them, but not necessarily from Derek. Um, and he took a lot of accountability for that today. Yeah. I, w- I wonder how much of it is the knowledge that you've got a couple, you know, major contributors that are out and, you know, trying to play hero ball a little bit or, you know, get a little fancy, you know, you're, they're knowing that they need to make a bigger impact, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but. Uh, yeah. They've been shooting relatively better lately. Um, over 50% from the floor against Maryland. Uh, 43% from three-point range um, also against Maryland. But. And free throws. We've been complaining about free throws yep. all year long. And they were uh, 24 of 26. Um, uh from Maryland, and you can't, Maryland, going to the line 26 times and connecting on almost all of them. How do you win like that? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, it, that game stood out to me, too, because it wasn't like, I mean, the turnovers were hurt. egregious. Yeah. 15 of them. But, but apart from that, it wasn't like they played that bad. I mean, no, was, they were just continued, a very similar level. They just yeah. continued to shoot themselves in the foot with badly timed turnovers and fouls. Like, you can't have Derek Walker ending that game on the bench. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, it, that about says it all. And especially that Maryland game, Sam Hoiberg scores 15, which is great. You know, you, you want those guys to step up, but. Denim Dawson, Kese Tominaga, and CJ Wilcher combined for 10 points. I mean, you're, you're, you're just not going to win like that. Nope. And, you know, Kese, you know, he's hot and cold. Yep. Um, but you need CJ to be more consistent, you know, like, and you need Denim to step up a little bit. And you just, you just can't have that. It's just, it's a winnable game. It was a winnable game. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, when, when those other Illinois guards, was, yeah, yeah. It, it, puts, it puts so much on Sam, too. You know, he, he's already playing in such of a, you know, playmaking role, and it's like now, they, now he's got to be, you know, like the leading scorer, too. It, it just puts a lot of pressure on him. Yeah, and moving forward, we're, uh, we're going to have to differentiate between Sam's, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, you, uh, <laughs> yeah, you meant Greasel. Greasel, uh, yes. But yeah, no, it's okay. We all talk out of turn. Like uh, like me saying that uh, Derek Walker fell out of the Maryland game. No, I'm just, they're all combining together at this yep. point uh, for me because uh, that, uh, that was the Illinois game that he fell out of. Oh, well. They all run together. Yeah. <laughs> especially when there are commonalities between them all. Um, Certainly. Well, since we're on that Illinois game, 72-56 was the, the final score, but... A lot closer. Yeah, Nebraska was in that. it pretty much the entire game until a very ugly uh, kind of end to it. Once again, 19 turnovers. Illinois shot 12 more free throws than Nebraska did. And like you said, Derek Walker fouling out. Sam Greasel came up big, uh, had, had a very big game, but... Ultimately, you know, it, all the success that they have, you know, these good stretches of play, it just, you need, you need 40 consistent minutes. And when the last 10 or, or whatever are ugly, I mean, that's, that's not a, a winning recipe in any way. That's putting it kindly. The last uh, however many minutes of that game weren't just ugly. They yeah. were abysmal. It's bad. 
so bad. Um, and then they have another big challenge this weekend. Uh, and State, a team that uh, they did not play very well against on the road earlier this year. Um, just like uh, almost like two weeks ago. Feels like yeah, it was right. yesterday almost. Um, that's the game that Emmanuel Bannemel got hurt in. Um, Juwan had already been out. Uh, but, you know, the question, how does Nebraska snap this losing streak? I don't know. Like, they have to be on top of it. Like, no boneheaded mistakes, no lazy turnovers, no, you know, ticky-tack fouls. Like, and granted, like, Big Ten officiating is what it is, but we're at the point in the season where you know that even if it's not a foul, like, even if there's contact, you may get called for it, so you've got to be clean. you got to go straight up. you got to have active hands and all of those things, and it's just... I don't know. Yeah, I would say probably need like 35, at least 35 combined points from Derek Walker and Sam Greasel. And then, you know, you, however many, you know, from everyone else, you, you got to keep the scoring low too. I mean, yeah. they're, they're not going to win games that are in the 70s or the 80s realistically. No, it's going to have to be, you know, a, just a, it's a fight. Yep. And Penn State is so good on the perimeter. That's what doomed Nebraska last time, and I don't think that's going to change. Maybe closer, but Nebraska's going to have to come out hot and like continue to stay hot. And I think they were almost scoreless for like the first like ten minutes of that game, mm-hmm. or something stupid like that uh, against Penn State last time. Again, it's all running together. Yeah, but this time. <laughs> The friendly confines of PBA. We'll see how much that can uh, swing things a little bit. Sunday home game. You know, hopefully, hopefully it'll be a, a good crowd out there motivating them. But it's supposed to be beautiful outside. Yes. So I don't know. Well, if <laughs> yeah, good point. Maybe <laughs> maybe we'll be outside. <laughs> I'll be there. Yeah, <laughs> you're stuck. You're stuck inside. So. That's okay. But on on the other side of things, we'll move on to the women's team. Um, which won a game this week, unlike the men's team. But mm-hmm. starting things off, 80-76 loss to Iowa. We, we previewed that a little bit in the last one and talked about Caitlin Clark. Well, she did Caitlin Clark things, 33 points, 12 rebounds, 9 assists. So close to a triple double. Yeah. So close. And, you know, well, it is a, a four-point margin uh, of victory there for Iowa. Nebraska really fell behind that second quarter. That was tough. They weren't going to get out of that until – Fourth quarter, you know, finally start shipping back, and you know they they did a good job of of evening things up. But again, it's it's really hard. I think it was like they got outscored by 17, 16 points, something like that in the second quarter. It was tough. Yeah, so hard to come back from that. And it it a tough road environment too. Yeah, absolutely. But hey, they they followed it up with a, a win at home, seventy one sixty seven over Michigan State which kind of the opposite, you know, as to what they experienced against Iowa. This time, you know, they were up early, and it was Michigan State that came back and really made it nervous and could have had a chance to, to take the lead there at the end, but Michigan State missed a couple free throws. Nebraska converts theirs, and wow, that was, you know, it's kind of, it's one that if it didn't go Nebraska's way, you would look at it as, you know, such a, bl- you know, blown. Missed opportunity, yeah. yeah. And one that'll haunt them on their resume as you mm-hmm. go into March, that type of stuff. Um, but yeah, they needed they needed that one. They absolutely needed it. Yeah, and oh wait, similar to the men's team, twenty six total turnovers. Oof, gotta gotta clean that up in practice as well. And they'll have the chance to uh, turn things around at Northwestern on Monday. Then another big one at home, number twenty one Illinois coming to town on Thursday. Very big because as we look at these uh, NCAA tournament projections. Same thing happening. They're right there on the bubble. Uh, the most recent one has them as the last four in potential 12 seed. Like I said, they need as many yep. as they can get. Like, even if it's ugly. Like, that's the mantra of the volleyball team, mm-hmm. and the women's basketball team needs to, needs to adopt it as well. If you're playing ugly, you still need to find ways to win, or win ugly, as uh, we succinctly say over in Devaney. So. Yep. And life, life on the bubble can be a little... A little tense, so so all these games uh, will mean a lot to those eventual postseason chances, most certainly. Yep. 
Well, I think that's all we got for basketball, but hey, we've got a, a random segment as always. I know you you listeners and, and viewers there at home are, you know, you're always wondering what's what are they gonna come up with this week? Well they this is always <laughs> you. This is your concoction. I'm gonna, <laughs> I just play along. I'm gonna, you know, we'll put a little bit of the blame on you. They don't they don't need to know that. But uh, today's segment we've got underrated, overrated, or adequately rated uh, for a couple of random things, somewhat related to sports, some Others, not so much. And first up, underrated, overrated, or adequately rated brunch? Underrated. Brunch is my favorite thing in, like, food-wise. So. I'm, I'm going to say adequately rated. I like it as a, a combination of breakfast and lunch, but I don't know. I don't, I don't want to set out on a day like, I got to have brunch. You know, that's, that's going to throw things off. Not if you'd, like, regularly plan it. Well, like, I don't know. I, it's, just, it's just the vibe you get when you're like, today's a brunch day versus a, a breakfast and a lunch day. It's yourself. different. Do it yourself. I love brunch. Well, I, I didn't say it was overrated. I said it was adequate. Whatever. It, it, has, it has solid esteem, and we'll, we'll keep it there. Okay. You, you would raise it, but. <laughs> All right, it's next up. Next up, All-Star Games. Overrated. I agree. I agree. Do we, do we really need them anymore? I kind of like what they're doing with the Pro Bowl. Yeah. Like, I think it's fun, like, watching them play dodgeball. Or, like, the Home Run Derby, for example. I think True. that's really fun. True, Home Run Derby, um, yeah. There are ways to make them fun, but, like, the games themselves, like, yes, like, these players need to be honored for being all-stars or being Pro Bowlers or all of those things because, um, you know, they make extra money for that, and it's a cool thing. Um, but... Do we need a glorified, you know, like, like, I mean, scrimmage, they, yeah, 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 a scrimmage, yep. like a flag football game, like, okay, cool, whatever. Yeah. I mean, I just, me personally, I haven't watched like an all-star game in years. I mean, I used to, you know, growing up, I was big, you know, MLB All-Star Game. You know, that, that's a little bit different, too, because it's in the middle of the year. Yeah. But, I mean, nowadays, it's like, I don't know. You see these players week in, week out. You don't, what is an All-Star Game really showing you, you know, that you don't get to see out there in a, on a normal basis? That's how I feel. Yeah. I mean, there are some aspects of, like, All-Star Weekend or Pro Bowl Weekend um, that are cool. Mm -hmm. um, like, I like the skills challenge. Like, I was on the treadmill last night watching um, – you know, quarterbacks throw to targets. I think that's fun. But, like, the games themselves are overrated. Yeah. We'll, we'll keep the home run derby. We'll keep the dunk contest. Yes. We'll keep this stuff. But, hey, scrap the games. Yes, <laughs> scrap the games. All right, next up, number three on our list, summer. Uh, adequately rated. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to go with that, too. It kind of stinks, you know, being, like, all hot and sweaty all the time. But... As we sit here in February, it sounded pretty good to me right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think that we all love the idea of summer mm -hmm. because it stems from us being in school, and that's the only real time that we get off. So I think that's where that comes from. It's like everyone looks forward to summer. But, like, now that we're adults and have, like, real jobs, uh, it's not as fun. Yeah. Got a favorite season? Uh, Mardi Gras season. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um... um that part of fall where it's like starting to cool down, mm -hmm. but it's not cold yet. Yep. So like early fall before the first snow. Yeah, I'm also I'm a I'm team fall as well. Enjoy enjoy the you know let the leaves change the colors, a little bit of crispness to the air. Nice. Yeah, I it's a, a sunny, no wind, and a sixty five degree day is my. It's my now we're talking. perfect yeah. day. All right, number four. This one is definitely sports-related. Time of possession in football. Uh, adequately rated. I think, you know, I, honest, this might be a hot take. I'm going to say underrated in this one because a lot of people would say overrated. I don't think it's overrated. Well, a lot of people would because, you, you know, well, you can score fast. You know, it, it doesn't really matter. But to me, it's like this is as basic as it gets. If you got the ball, the other team doesn't have it. Yeah. That's my yeah. that's my line of thinking. That's why I think it's adequately rated. But okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm not making a. No. I'm not quite making a compelling case. Yeah. You. I mean. Let's just let's just move on. Then. Okay. Forget about it. <laughs> All right. Number five. Avocados. Underrated. Overrated. 
I knew it. <laughs> you fun hater. Uh, I I don't know. You know, this is this it could it just comes down to personal preference. I'm not a I'm not a big guacamole or what? Any any sort of avocado product. I mean, it's all right, but there's there's better fruits and vegetables out there. There's better stuff. I eat like two avocados a day. I knew I knew you're going to get mad at me saying this. Yeah, well, you before we started taping, he compared me to a grandma. So that was word choice. Word choice only. <laughs> All right, last we'll one. We'll see. So, but yeah, no, I love yeah. avocados. I knew. I, I make knew. my own guac. Yep. It's great. Last one on our list: air travel. Can I just say sucks? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you can. It just as a as a shorter person, I don't find it as tough because, like, I'm not. I still have leg room because. You know, I'm five, two and a half. Mm. The half is important. But I couldn't imagine like navigating air travel when you're like over five, five. Like, no, like that just feels difficult. Because if I'm perfectly situated in my seat and I'm five, two and a half and I'm like way under average for height, can't be good for the majority of yeah, the population. Yeah, some people, some people are getting cramped up there. That's for sure. Yeah, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna say adequately rated. I would say overrated because honestly, like the experience of flying, it kind of stinks. You feel like more tired having done it. But on the other hand, it's like I don't know, just having the ability to fly across an entire country, you know, fly across half the world. You know, it, it just it makes you appreciate how fast there. Yeah, it doesn't take you two days to get to California. Yeah. It's not like not like you you got to set out and you know on the the giant steamer you know sail up and down the Mississippi uh, to to get there to New Orleans you get a get a nice flight instead. Yes, can't wait. Less than two weeks. <laughs> yes. Well, look forward to that and uh, look forward to our coverage. Uh, men's basketball big game coming up on Sunday. Women's basketball got important games coming up this week as well. Uh, so stay tuned. Journalstar.com. Uh, I think that's all we got in terms of craziness there at the end of this episode but once again uh, we really appreciate all of you tuning in and listening yeah to these weekly episodes appreciate bringing them to you and i'm luke mullen and for amy just hey thanks for tuning in to life in the red we'll see you next week